الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله الملك الحق المبين وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وأن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار We begin in the name of Allah the most merciful the grantor of mercy all praise and glory belongs to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Indeed, Allah is deserving of the best of thanks and the most beautiful of praises. And we testify that no one is worthy of worship but Allah alone without any partners, the true supreme king. And that the Prophet Muhammad was his servant and his prophet and his messenger, whom he sent as a mercy to the worlds. And the truest of words are the words of Allah, the great glorious Quran, and the best of guidance, the Sunnah, the example of our Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And the most dangerous of matters is the newly added matters into this religion. For every single newly invented matter into this perfect and complete way of life involves removing something from it first, right? And thus he warned us against that and told us that it's a leading astray. So every newly invented matter is a leading astray that only leads to the fire. May Allah Azza wa protect our, us and our families and every sincere seeker from any belief, statement, or action that would bring us closer to the fire. Allahumma ameen. I pray at the onset of this gathering that Allah makes all of our actions righteous and makes them sincerely for His sake and not allow any of His creation a share of our intentions. Allahumma ameen. And of course with Ramadan, I would not say creeping on us, right? Ramadan, with great pleasure, we await it in the horizon, the young and the old, right? The righteous for a chance to put it in overdrive and the sinful and we are, we are all that person for a chance to turn a new leaf everyone's excited about the month of Ramadan and we say this many a times but we should continue to say it because no matter how many times we say it the factors outside that cause us to forget it are even more and that is our statement that we should treat every Ramadan like our last because one of our Ramadans will be our last and Allah has barred it from His creation, knowing which one will be yours. Last Ramadan was my father's last, rahmatullahi alayhi. And one Ramadan will be my last, one Ramadan will be your last. And you have no proof, and there's no way for you to know for certain which one it's going to be. Am I going to have such an opportunity again, an opportunity to rekindle my relationship with Allah in overdrive? Right on a much higher level and many a times before I move further people they underachieve in Ramadan because they have an incorrect perception about what this month is all about and they say man I, I just depresses me I don't know if you felt this way or heard someone say this that I work so hard in Ramadan and then no matter what every single year after Ramadan I, <laughs> I downsize again in my ibadah and so that takes away from my motivation the next time I try and this is wrong Ramadan is supposed to be special even in the amount that you devote yourself in it it's okay if you devote yourself in this month of Ramadan in a manner that you don't devote yourself in the rest of the year even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was like that because this is a time among other reasons when the leading good deeds are on sale there's like a, a spree you have to go in there and get everything that you need as fast as possible, more than you can carry, if you will, before you head out. You know, in like what they call Black Friday, but we Muslims don't believe it's Black Friday, right? Black is the, the Friday is the brightest day of the week for us. Things are on sale. It's like, oh man, you start picking up things you don't even need, right? It's like, yeah, but like it's only for 30%. Yeah, but it's 30% more than you need to spend, right? And when in terms of dunya, this shouldn't be the mentality of a believer, a brother or a sister, right? Without being picky here, right? Without picking on anybody. You go in there and you grab. Ramadan is like that. Of course, there's no such thing as too much, right? When we're talking about dunya, you should only buy what you need. And if you don't need it, you get rid of it. That should be the idea, right? So you don't cling. It doesn't seep into your heart. But when it comes to deen, you need to pile on as much as you can. Because Ramadan is going to do one of two things. Be storage for you for a rainy day, right? And the, the, the rainiest day is the day of judgment. Are we agreed? So this could be your last. 
or the second, it's going to need to be enough to carry you throughout the entire year. That's the whole point. You're supposed to fill up your tank. It's almost like a rest area on your journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You got to fill up good to make sure you get to the next rest area. You know, the good sheikh, uh, Mufti Ismail Mank, hafizahullah, he has a beautiful metaphor. He says Ramadan is like a catapult. You know a catapult? Manjaniq? You, put the, you see in the movies, right? You, you pull it back, oh, you pull and squeeze as hard as you can, but you're only going back like what, 10 feet, 20 feet? And you hold on as tight as you can, you pull as hard as you can, and then you let it go. And it goes 100, 200 feet, right? Ramadan is like that. You pull on yourself, you squeeze as much as you can out of yourself. So that when you come out of Ramadan, you come out of Ramadan cruising. You're on, yeah? Cruise control, your autopilot, it's carrying you with that momentum. By the time your momentum starts dipping, you're already at the next Ramadan. That's the point. How did Allah Azza wa Jal teach us that? By augmenting the reward of the leading good deeds in this month. What are the greatest good deeds in Islam? That's a question. What, the, what are the greatest good deeds in Islam? The only way to slow myself down is to ask questions. I always say that. So let me ask questions. Fasting. What's it? What else? Salah. Zakah. Charity. And? Hajj, right? Visiting all, the four pillars after the Shahada. These are the greatest good deeds. Islam stands on these. They are the greatest embodiment of surrendering to Allah. That's why Islam is built on them. Surrendering Islam is built on these five. Shahada and these four good deeds. As for salah, it's bumped up. It's on sale in Ramadan, right? As he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in hadith of Bukhari and Muslim. No, this hadith is just in Bukhari. Abu Hurair radiallahu an. He said, whomever stands to pray in, Layla, in, in Ramadan with full faith and seeking the reward... He gets forgiven for his previous sins. But there's another upgrade, by the way, on praying in Ramadan. In Sunan al-Tirmidhi, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَن قَامَ مَعَ الْإِمَامِ حَتَّى يَنْصَرِفَ كُتِبَتْ لَهُ قِيَامُ لَيْلَ How awesome is that? Whoever stands with the Imam until the Imam is the first to leave, till he's done praying, it is written for him that he stood the whole night. So salah's on sale. Pile it on. As for fasting, fasting is the, the primary uh, worship of the month. This is clear. You know this. As for Hajj, the Hadith of Ibn Abbas in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَعُمْرَةٌ فِي رَمَضَانٍ تَعْدِلُ حِجَّةً مَعِي And if a person were to make Umrah in the month of Ramadan, this is like making Hajj with me. So Hajj without the effort of Hajj or anything close to it. Just the Umrah. Umrah takes an hour, two hours. There's an upgrade there. And the last of them, Zakah, Ab Abdullah ibn Abbas also, radiallahu anhum, he says in the Hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَجْوَدَ النَّاسِ The Messenger of Allah, صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ, was the most generous of people. وَأَجْوَدُ مَا يَكُونُ فِي رَمَضَانِ حِينَ يَلْقَاهُ جِبْرِيلُ يُدَارِسُهُ الْقُرْآنِ And the most generous he was, was in the month of Ramadan when Jibreel would come and meet him to rehearse with him the Quran. He was more gracious with the good. He was more gracious than a Rih uh, Mursala. The unbound wind, yeah? The yeah, the unleashed wind, the wind that goes in every direction. It gives the land that it needs and the land that doesn't need. It brings clouds to the lands that have drought and, the, and clouds to lands that already are quenched. It gives everybody and everything. He was even more generous in Ramadan. So this is, don't feel bad that you're going to go all out in Ramadan and then slow down a bit after. It's okay. The month is made for that. Pile it on so that you can cruise out of this month. So that you can get, you know they say it takes 28 days to build a habit. Ramadan is at least 29 days. Yeah, at least. 29 or 30 depending on the sighting. So it's supposed to habituate you, get you into the habit of doing these good deeds. Even if on a slightly lesser level. It's supposed to put you in the habit of being alert, observant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything that you do. Yes? Yes or no? Which is what? Which is taqwa. Being observant of Allah, conscious of Allah, they translate it, is taqwa. 
And by the way, every Muslim has taqwa. Right or wrong? Do you agree with me or you guys want to debate? Every Muslim has taqwa. What does taqwa mean? Forget conscious of Allah. I already said that. Give me another one. What does taqwa mean? Where are the Arab students here? The Arabic students. What is taqwa? To shield, to avoid. It taqwa means to protect himself. To shield himself, to avoid something. Got it? So taqwa means to shield yourself from what would harm you. Namely, the anger of Allah. So you're, you're aware of the limits. You're aware of the lines. That's why they translate it as being conscious of Allah. Meaning the limits of Allah. You get it now where the connection comes from? Fear of Allah, consciousness, obedience. That's why they're all interchangeable. Every Muslim has automatically a degree of taqwa or else he wouldn't be Muslim. He shields himself from what? No, there are Muslims who don't shield themselves from haram, they're still Muslim. He has at least enough taqwa, at least enough avoidance of disbelief. But that doesn't mean some Muslims don't have a higher degree of taqwa. Because taqwa comes on many different levels. The highest degree of taqwa, I'll give this to you before we start talking about the Quran. This is a good gift, inshallah. Alright? The highest degree of taqwa is when you basically become immune to shaitan. He cannot touch you anymore. Almost. <laughs> I say almost because only the prophets are sinless, yes? Or protected from sin. But you almost become that person. He almost has no more access to you. In fact, he doesn't want to be anywhere near you. Like the hadith of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِيهِنْ لَكَ يَا ابْنَ الْخَطَّابِ مَا لَقِيَكَ الشَّيْطَانُ فِي فَجِّنْ إِلَّا وَسَلَكَ فَجًّا غَيْرَ فَجِّ Meaning, how amazing is your circumstance, O Umar ibn al-Khattab? Shaytan doesn't find you on a road, on a street, except that he takes his street other than your street. Why? Umar was so conscious of Allah, so fearful of Allah, that his creation, the creation of Allah became fearful of Umar. Beginning with who? Shaytan himself. There's a degree less than that. And that is when shaitan is able to catch you once in a blue moon, but you quickly collect yourself. Allah Azza wa Jal says, in Anna Surah Al-Araf, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِّنَ الشَّيْطَانِ تَذَكَّرُوا فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ Indeed, the people of taqwa are those that when shaitan touches them with a ta'if is like a quick hit. It's translated as an impulse in the translation. Yeah. You know tawaf? Tawaf is around the Kaaba. It's like quick, quick turns, quick circling. Yes? When shaitan touches them with a ta'if, meaning a quick hit. Like you know in boxing they say like he blindsides you, right? He catches you off guard. The people of taqwa are those that when shaitan catches them, Right? Blindsides them. Quick hit. Catches them off guard. Quickly to the karu. They remember. Remember what? Remember Allah. Remember His greatness. Remember their, their tininess. Remember laying in the grave. Remember the questioning. Remember standing in the hereafter. They remember. They come to their senses. فَإِذَاهُمْ مُبُصِيرٌ All of a sudden they have clear insight again. So that's a lesser degree. Where shaitan catches you once in a blue moon. Catches you off guard. Very rarely. In something that isn't huge. Perhaps a minor sin. There's a degree less than that. And that's when shaitan knows your inlets. You have taqwa, but he still studied you better than you've studied yourself. And he's able to slowly, slowly, slowly drag you into committing some of the major sins. Because in Surah Ali Imran, Allah Azza is speaking about the people of taqwa. And then he says, وَالَّذِينَ And they are those, إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَ When they commit an obscenity, a huge sin, like a major sin. أو ظلموا أنفسهم or they wrong themselves ذكروا الله then they remember Allah meaning they don't remember Allah until they fell into a big hole oh man I can't believe I did riba again I can't believe I drank again I can't believe I committed fornication again yes may Allah forgive us and you may Allah bring us to his shores safely Allahumma amin but on that journey we go left and right and we don't realize how until we've committed a big one an enormity that's a lesser degree of taqwa 
the least degree of taqwa when you're doing everything. You're just avoiding kufr and nothing else. That's minimal Muslim. Minimal faith. Now, how do you figure out the degree of taqwa that you have? Tell me. What time is Aisha here? 9.45. Awesome. We'll be done before then. Way before then. Inshallah. How do you figure out your level of taqwa? You guys should answer. Because if I answer, you might throw me out the window. You're going to hear my answer and think I'm crazy. Faddalu. These are all correct. You know what the easiest one is? Don't laugh at me, okay? Don't kill me, you promise? Listen to shaitan. Don't listen. I mean like hear him out. I don't mean listen like obey. Because hearing and listening are two different things. Hear, I mean just the sense. You can determine how much taqwa you have based on what shaitan is whispering to you. Because shaitan's attacks are strategic. He's not going to come to someone that's praying Isha and Fajr in the masjid and telling him and tell him disbelieve in Allah. It's like, what? Disbelieve in Allah? No way, right? He's going to take him gradually, step by step. Yeah? He's going to tell him, you missed Isha, it's okay, Fajr. Fajr, uh, Isha. Right? And then after a while, he starts praying in the masjid. He starts praying at home now. And then at home, he's just like, uh, okay, I missed the jama'ah anyway, so the late to the end of its time. And the end of its time starts getting tight, so he starts mixing the prayers. He starts rushing them. Then he starts combining them. Then he starts missing prayers. When he starts missing prayers, he falls prey to his desires. So he starts committing sins. And these sins get bigger. And they become major. And the guilty conscience, no one likes to have it, so you begin to justify it. And when you justify your sins, you're right there at disbelief. Right? So if shaitan is telling you commit zina, he knows that's a possibility for you. That's your level. Or else he wouldn't have whispered it. You understand? If he's telling you disbelieve, he knows you're right there. If he's telling you miss isha, because he knows that's the possibility. That's where he could be able to get you. Now, the month of Ramadan, fasting has been prescribed for you like it's been prescribed for those before you so that you may attain taqwa. How much taqwa can Ramadan offer you? Depending on the level of your fast. There are levels of taqwa. How many of them are you going to get in Ramadan? Depending on the level of your fast. You see, because the fasting is on many levels. There is what you can call bare minimum fasting. Which is what? Answer. We'll get the fiqh and the spiritual, everything in one night. Food, drink, intimacy. Basically, I mean, without getting into the fiqh. Basically, staying, that's minimal fasting. Okay? That's not proper enough. That means you have fasted a valid fast. Allah will not ask you, why didn't you fast? Allah is not going to punish you for not fasting. Okay? But that doesn't mean it's an, that it's, it's good enough. It's proper. This is bare minimum. What's my proof? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَرُبَّ صَائِمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ مِنْ صِيَامِهِ إِلَّا الْجُوعُ وَالْعَطَشِ Perhaps a fasting person gets nothing out of his fast, but eating and drink. It was narrated by Ibn Majah. From Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. Also, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَإِذَا كَانَ يَوْمُ صَوْمِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَلَا يَرْفَثْ وَلَا يَصْخَبْ وَلَا يَجْهَلْ And when one of you is fasting, let him not يَصْخَبْ uh, be loud and boisterous, يَرْفُثْ uh, be sinful, يَجْهَلْ be foolish, let him not do any of that. And he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, مَنْ لَمْ يَدَعْ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ وَالْجَهْلِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةٌ أَنْ يَدَعَ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ Whomever does not abandon false speech and acting upon such falsehood and acting foolishly, Allah has no need of him abandoning his food and his drink. Meaning the person that's backbiting, why in the world are you even fasting? Does that mean the person that backbites needs to repeat his fast? Ibn Hazm said yes, rahimahullah. The vast majority of the scholars say no. 
what he did is that he invalidated the fruit of his fast. Like his fast is valid, but there's nothing going to come out of it. He's not going to get any taqwa out of that fast. He didn't really practice a significant amount of being conscious of Allah. That's the whole point of fasting, isn't it? Behind closed doors, no one's around, but I'm conscious of Allah. So the person that comes and tells me, uh, should I still fast if I don't wear hijab? You say, yes, yes, you should still fast. I'm not saying you need to make up the day when, you've, when you haven't wore hijab, but you miss the whole point of the fast system, right? When the person says, I'm fasting, but I still uh, smoke at night. So it's like, what's going on, right? During the day, it breaks the fast. But at night, you miss the whole point, akhi. You really miss the whole point. So the bare minimum fast is to stay away from the invalidators of the fast, like food, drink, and intimacy. The second level of fasting, to get some fruit out of your fast, is to stay away from everything that Allah has prohibited, to truly be conscious of Him. The third level that some of the ulama mention of fasting is to stay away from whatever would distract you from Allah Azza wa Jal. To teach yourself to permanently be observant of Him. May Allah grant us that station. To lock the eyes of your heart on Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. To be hypnotized, stunned from everything else because you're exalting Him. And automatically, if you're like that, you will constantly find yourself drawing nearer to Him. And you will taste a sweetness that will drive you even faster towards Him. It'll become a ripple effect, a virtuous cycle of virtue. It'll automatically be like that. That's why He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah gives a ajil bushra al mu'min, like a first installment, if you will, a rushed, immediate reward for a believer. Of that is the people praising him. Of that is the sweetness of faith, faith he tastes. It carries him. That's a whole nother level. Allah gives you conviction. Solidifies the iman in your heart. Gives you a sweetness that nothing in this dunya can be compared to. As Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah says, there's nothing in this dunya that is comparable to anything in Jannah except one thing. And that is the blessing of iman. The taste of iman. That is the paradise of this world. That whomever it hasn't tasted will not taste the paradise of the hereafter. So shaitan comes to eat away your taqwa all year round. And we're stuck in his nets. And we have to rip out once and for all. Or else, like the fish, if he doesn't get out of the net fast enough, he gets put to the grill. Right? Likewise, we have been caught in shaitan's nets all year round. He has confused us. He has tempted us. He has blurred our clarity. He has, you know, weakened our determination. The way out of all this is to become conscious of Allah. Becoming conscious of Allah, to feed your soul with that, you need to do two things. Number one is to ignore your body so you can focus on your soul. Right? Number two is to actually nourish that soul of yours. As for ignoring your body a little bit, because they fight, these two fight. See, the soul is from the heavens and the, the body is from the earth and the body wants to stay here and the soul wants to go up there. You understand? Allah made it, ab alhamdulillah, <laughs> Allah made it mandatory at least one month, we ignore our body a little bit. And that's why in the month of Ramadan when you fast, please, like, don't make qada. You know how people pray qada or qaza, right, when you miss a prayer? We make qada of the food we miss out on in Ramadan at night and at Eid, right? It's like, I gotta eat double and I haven't eaten all day. And then he gets up and I can't breathe. What do you mean you can't breathe, akhi? It's just Food is supposed to give you energy, like it's supposed to strengthen you. If you're eating so much that it's weakening you, like it, there's something wrong, yeah? We're supposed to eat so that we can live. We're not supposed to live so that we can eat. We've reversed the equation somehow. Like, there are people that actually gain weight in Ramadan. That's a problem. Once again, you, it appears you've missed the point. You know, the hadith narrated by Ibn Majah also from, from Al-Maqdab ibn Ya'di Karib, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا مَلَأَ أَبْنِ آدَمَ وِعَاءً شَرٌ مِّن بَطْنِ The son of Adam has never filled a container worse for him than his stomach. 
بحسب ابن آدم من الطعام لقيمات يقمن صلبه. It's enough for the son of Adam with regards to his food a few morsels that would erect his back, meaning to give him energy to stand. Energy. فإن كان لا محالة if there's no way around it فثلث لطعامه وثلث لشرابه وثلث لنفسه. If there's no way around it means what? What does it mean? There's no way around it. Like you have to eat a lot. Why? An exceptional circumstance. Someone invited you and you want to be a good guest. Someone stood up the whole time. Right? This is you accidentally overfilled the plate. <laughs> right? You don't want to throw it out because no one else is going to eat it and you can't put it, you know, to, to go. If there's no way around it, and that shouldn't be every time, then then don't kill yourself. A third for your food and a third for your drink and a third for your breathing. Breathing. I can't breathe. What do you mean you can't breathe, Akhi? You know, the Umar ibn Khattab said, Beware of becoming overeating, obesity. He said, Because this would make you lazy from worship and will be an inlet for shaitan and will be an invitation for diseases to your body. And you know, even today, tons, non Muslims, they say one of the greatest reasons. For bodily diseases that we have in this generation especially Is because we've eaten foods Before the previously eaten foods have been digested Like that pile on Is the reason why we have so many diseases that didn't exist And not at these rates in the previous generation We eat so much These physical illnesses, right? The physical harms of overeating is nothing Compared to the actual spiritual harm because the worst thing that's going to happen to you, may Allah forbid, if you become diabetic, right? You develop a cancer. You develop a tumor. May Allah give shifa to all the sick Muslims. Say ameen. But the worst that it'll do will kill you. There's still paradise or hell. There's still a chance, right? But when you've suffocated your spirit because all you're feeding is your body, then you've become disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You haven't fed your soul. Allah created you from mud and He placed in this mud your nourishment for your body. Yeah? Mud from mud. And He gave you a soul from above and He sent down this Quran as a soul to feed your soul as well. وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِّنْ أَمْرِنَا And in this fashion we revealed to you a soul from our commandment. مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانُ وَلَكِنْ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُورًا نَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ نَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا You didn't know what the book was or what faith was, O Muhammad, but we made it a light. A light by which we guide whomever we wish of our slaves. So the first step to being conscious is to ignore your body a little bit. Right? The arch enemy of your soul. And then to focus on your soul. How? With this Qur'an that Allah revealed. To nourish that soul of yours. Learn to recite the Qur'an. Get connected with Allah through the words that He gave you. You know we're in an age when we're connected with absolutely everybody, right? Connected with everything. Like, I, all I gotta do, and I'm, in, I'm a New Yorker, so I could be in the middle of Times Square, and I can jump on WhatsApp and talk to my cousin's uncle's best friend who's on his bareback cow next to the stream by the village in Egypt, can't I? You can... I, but we've be, this is supposed to be an asset to humanity. It has become so destructive. Like this is not something that, this is not my problem now. The whole world is like this now. You know, in, in the country of my parents in Egypt, when you're telling me that half the country is below the poverty line and 70% of the country has cell phones, there's something wrong, yeah? When they can't find food and they have two, two phones. This has become a disease. And so part of you reconnecting with the Qur'an is you have to download the Qur'an app. If you're, if you're one of those people, the phone is always in your hands. If you don't have enough pockets for a mushaf. Let this connect. Because everybody you connect with and you feel like you cannot disconnect from for a second, they will all be left behind. And you will die and your phone will become recycled. And you're going to move on to your Creator. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right or wrong? Isn't this true? We feel so desperately in need of this to connect with people. We enter the bathrooms, one of the mashayikh says, and he walks back out and says, Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I forgot my phone. He takes his phone to go back into the bathroom. Don't we do that? 
And you're looking at me like, whoa, how did he know that? How did I know that? We're all like that. You have your phone next to you on the pillow. You got to check your feeds before you get up for fajr. Right? Make sure your salah is valid. <laughs> right? Download. Ask your friends that have one. What's a good Quran app? Learn to recite the Quran number one. A month is more than enough time to learn how to recite the Quran and build for yourself a wird, meaning a routine, a regular routine. I'm going to read one ayah a day. I don't care. But do it and stick to it and build on it slowly. I don't mind. And everything that I'm telling you about this food resolution, this Quran resolution, all of that start tonight for two reasons. Number one is when you get into that marathon known as Ramadan, you don't want to catch a cramp. You don't want to go overload too fast. And there's only one month. So start now in preparation for Ramadan. Warm up. Secondly, and more importantly, perhaps, is so that you get into the habit of not only worshipping Allah in Ramadan. Right? Like we have this problem that Ramadan is the start and we're already planning that the Eid is the stop. Like Ramadan is, no, astaghfirullah, I can't do that, akhi, it's Ramadan. Meaning, as soon as Ramadan, we even do qada of our sins after Ramadan sometimes, don't we? We do qada of the sin. Like Ramadan is just a pause button, we don't want that. We want Ramadan to be the eject button. You take the tape and throw it in the garbage and it's a new me now. Right or wrong? Agreed? So, find this app and start now. Learn to recite, find the qada you like, an app that's user friendly, whatever you need to do. After every salah, one ayah. Or every night, one ayah. Before the sun sets, before you go, you break your... Whatever you need to do. Figure it out. If it's worthy enough to you, you'll make time to plan it out. It's not so complicated. I'm not telling you for, asking you for a five-year plan. After reciting the Qur'an, know that all the virtues of the Qur'an, of reciting it and double the reward for struggling and beautifying your voice and committing it to memory... All of those are so that you would understand it. That's level two. Like, should I understand the Quran or should I recite it? No, you need to do both. Okay? Because it's a link. One to another. But when you understand it, that's not enough. Link number three, I'm going to ask you, the third part of this chain to transform your life once and for all is for you to reflect on it. The Qur'an has a profound effect simply hearing it recited, especially if you're the reciter. So that's number one, the Qur'an on your tongue. Then understanding the meaning is the second part. That's with your mind. You need to understand it. These meanings, you need to present them to your heart. So tongue, mind, heart. You need to present them to your heart to reflect on them. In that, you unleash the power of the Qur'an. That's why the Qur'an came. Is that clear? So you have to correct the way your tongue pronounces it. And regularize your routine with the Qur'an. Number two, you must understand what you're reciting. Number three, that's not, that's not enough. Like you understand, I can, if you understand, then you might reflect. But if you don't understand, you will never reflect. Right? What are you going to reflect on? The nice sound? It's not, there's no way you're going to get the message. This is a letter written for, by Rabbul Alameen and Lawh al Mahfud, spoken to Jibreel alayhi salam, given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You should see it as a privilege that you're allowed to recite it, that you're allowed to understand it, that your limited mind is able to comprehend it at least on some level. Abdullah ibn Abbas, you know what he says about the ayah? وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ We made the Qur'an easy to be remembered. So is there anyone willing to remember? He says, لَوْلَا أَنْ يَسَّرَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَى لِسَانِ الْآدَمِيِّينَ مَا اسْتَطَاعَ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْخَلْقِ أَنْ يَتَكَلَّمَ بِكَلَامِ اللَّهِ Had Allah not made it easy for His creation, for the tongues of His creation to repeat it, no one of these children of Adam would have been able to repeat the words of Allah the Mighty and Majestic. Like think about it. how can I repeat His words? Like how? You understand the message he's trying to relay here. So, recite, understand, reflect. There's a, uh, a piece that I came across years ago, and I presented it in different ways in different times. I, I published it a little at length. You can look it up on Muslim Matters, because I'm going to rush through it now. 
but it's some beautiful life experience they were gained through life experience among other things of some of the students of the Quran very high level students of knowledge in certain parts of the world regarding factors that help you reflect now um, we're going to help each other how, how okay reflect what do I mean reflect like how do I reflect so these are fuels that will fact, factors that will fuel your reflection inshallah for those that are writing keep writing those that are not writing beat up the people that wrote and take their notes inshallah deal طيب, Bismillah. the first of them when you're with the Quran there, there are 11 I'll read them fast inshallah get done before Isha you need to find yourself a setting where you are totally alone not with your phone as it receives calls right and at a time when you know people are going to keep interrupting your thought process and you're receiving notifications and all of that. Allah commands us with tadabbur. The dubur of something is its back end. Right? Tadabbur means go look behind these words. Why did I choose this word? Right? So that requires your undivided attention. The second is that when you are alone, being alone for short spurts is not good enough. You need to prepare yourself to sit for long periods of time. I'm going to dare to say at least 10 to 15 minutes. I'm going to at least 10 to 15 just to put a number on it if I had to. Because they say that the message that lay, lies within the Quran is like a good friend or is like a friend. The longer you sit with him, the more of his secrets he begins to disclose to you. And whomever has tried to build a relationship with the Quran can notice this. That like you look at a certain meaning like whoa how didn't I see that before? Right? Like, it's right there. It's hidden right in front of me. How is it hiding? Allah's book is like that. It refuses to have the leftovers of your time. It refuses to be marginalized. Allah called His book, among other things, Al-Kitabul Aziz. The book that is mighty and proud. It refuses to be second place. It re refuses to share space in the top shelf of your heart. So you sit there for a while, then you start seeing things. But they were right in front of me. Yeah, they were. But you hadn't qualified yet. You had to prove your loyalty first. And those of you are nodding because you've seen this, seen this yourself. We need to always keep that in mind. The third of them is to brief yourself on the meanings. Because once again, reflecting is secondary to understanding. If you don't understand, you're not going to reflect. Or you cannot reflect. If you do understand, you might reflect. Yeah? Al-Tabari rahimahullah used to say A'jabu mimman lam yaqra it tafsira Kayfa yastamti'u bil Qur'an Like I marvel, like I'm amazed How can someone not know the meanings And enjoy the Qur'an Of course there's an enjoyment to just hearing it And I know you have your favorite qari that you hear And you, it's a tear jerker for you Yeah that's fine But compared to the, the delight of understanding it There's no comparison Night and day the fourth of them, so brief yourself on the meanings. A trustworthy translation is more than enough. Muhsin Khan, Taqiyuddin Hilali, Sahih International. These are all great translations. Pick one up and let it be your best friend. Number five, four. Try to frequent the reflections of those that did so correctly. Meaning what? The early Muslims, you can find this in tafsir books, you can find this in lectures. The early Muslims, look at their example. They'll teach you that skill of how to reflect on the Qur'an itself. And I'll give two quick examples very quickly. Wuhay ibn al-Ward rahimahullah, whenever he would read the ayah, وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا And remember when Ibrahim was raising the pillars of the Kaaba, erecting the Kaaba, him and his son Ismail saying, Oh our Lord, accept from us. Wuhay ibn al-Ward would cry at that ayah. And the people would wonder, like, why are you crying? This there's nothing to cry about here. He said, this is the, the friend of Allah. Building the greatest house of Allah. Worried that not, it could not be accepted of him. Meaning, what, what gave us this false sense of security? Right? Where I give a few dollars or I show up one day at Fajr and I'm just like, you know, like no, one, no one's like me. You know, I'm spotless. This, you would learn this from the way they looked at the ayat. When Hafs ibn Sulaiman, the famous uh, scholar of the Qur'at, the recitations of the Qur'an, he heard his students, Ziyad, 
reciting alam nashrah laka sadrak wa wada'na anka wizrak alladhi anqada dhahrak have we not expanded for your chest and lowered from you your burden of your sin that weighed down your back he began to cry so his student Ziyad said to him I don't get it like why are you crying it's not, nothing to do with you this is a happy moment Allah is saying the great things he did for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he's saying he's saying he forgave him for his sins that weighed down his back so what will our sins do to our backs look at the insight they'll teach you that skill of presenting each ayah to your own heart. And we'll get back to that point in a bit. Number five, try to grasp the overall themes of a surah. Like a surah, by definition, is, a, is something that has been fenced off. Like a surah is a fence. So a surah is a bundle of verses that Allah chose to separate from another bundle of verses. Ask yourself why. What is here as opposed to there? And you'll realize there are certain themes and then you can read the whole surah in light of those themes. The easiest example, the easiest example that I can think of, Ar-Rahman, the beginning of the surah, Allah's name. The end of the surah, Tabarak asmu rabbik, blessed is the name of your Lord. That means every single ayah there is connected somehow. Now go figure it out. So if it's all about Allah's mercy, Allah al Quran understood. He taught the Quran from His mercy. Khalaq al Insan understood from His mercy. Allah al Biyan He taught him articulation of from His mercy. Then keep going. Then He speaks about how He torments people in the hellfire. How is that from His mercy? Think you'll find out. That's part of His mercy too. That those who were believing through thick and thin will be gratified to see that Allah will not equate them with those that defied and denied. From His mercy is that He will not just throw everybody in paradise. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa those that tried to kill him. Isa alayhi salam and those that tried to execute him. The believers today and those that killed them for being believers. They will not, the people of paradise of their glee is of them noticing Allah's mercy is them being allowed to see those others in the hellfire. Read the whole surah like that now. That was number five, try to grasp the overall theme of the surah. We're running out of time, I have to go a little faster. Number six, living with the prophets. Keeping in mind they were human beings, how they acted. Why did Allah show us their struggles and that they were human beings? Why did Allah tell us about their struggles more than their times of ease? Read about all that. Try to live with them, allying with them against their anim enemies. Relating, to the, relating their lives to ours. Why did Allah quote this statement in his life and not all the other things that he said that were wise? Why, this one was, why was this one so wise? The most wise. To be cited for his last and final revelation in the Quran. Living with the prophets is huge. While keeping in mind they were human beings. Number seven, knowing the circumstances of revelation. This is, of course, adds a great deal of context. A Meccan surah versus a Medinan surah. What was really going on mostly in Mecca? What was going on in Medina? Number eight, focusing on oneself and one's flaws. Like, walk to the Quran and say, listen, we're making a deal. I'm going to read you for me. I'm not going to read you for anybody else right now. Like, you know, the Salaf, they had different words, like different routines. They had one khatma, like one read through the Quran, that was just about amount. Like, I am devoting my feet to stand in front of Allah to each night for seven juz. Right? A fourth of the Quran uh, each day. Like Al-Urul ibn Zubair used to do. They would have a completely separate word just for reflecting ayah by ayah. And this khatma would take them years sometimes. No problem. So you come to the Quran and say, listen, sh tell me about myself. Yeah? Show me my flaws. Uh, no matter what I discover here, just so you can like remove the interference. Like we said in the khutbah today. I'm not posting anything I discover here. Any gem I find, I'm not putting it on Facebook. Yeah, I'm not going to rush and tell somebody, oh man, subhanAllah, I read this ayah today. Wallah, I was crying. Wallah. <laughs> you know, that stuff, that silly stuff we do all the time. Make a deal with yourself. Just so you can ensure your intention would be pure. Uh, tell me about me. If you do that, you will realize the ayat in the Quran, one ayah can rid you of so many diseases. A quick example I just had here in my notes. 
Maliki Yawmuddin, you are the owner of the greatest day, the day of retribution, the day of recompense, right? If you're arrogant and you're presenting your heart to this ayah, it will break your arrogance. Man, I don't even own this smaller day. I can't control things here, right? Who am I, right? This is the owner of the greatest day, the day whose length is 50,000 years, right? At the same time, if you're a coward, this very ayah will brace your cowardice, will strengthen you. Why am I afraid of anybody? Why am I afraid of my boss or afraid of the Islamophobes? Why am I afraid of anybody? Allah owns this day for He owns the greatest day. Of course, He owns these lesser days. It will do all of that, this one ayah, if you devote your heart to it. Similarly, you know, Sulaiman al Taymi, rahimahullah, he used to say, Whomever does not live fearful of the hereafter should worry that he will not be of those that are admitted to paradise in the hereafter. Because, look at how he reflects. He said, Allah Azza wa Jal says that the people of paradise are going to have a conversation. And in that conversation, they're going to say, Inna kunna qablu fi ahlina mushfiqeen. فَمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا وَوَقَانَ عَذَابَ السَّمُومِ إِنَّا كُنَّا مِنْ قَبْلُ نَدْعُوهُ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْبَرُّ الرَّحِيمِ They approached one another, يَتَسَأَلُونَ The ayah says, asking one another. They say, man, we used to be among our people very apprehensive, very fearful. But Allah conferred a great favor upon us and protected us from the torment of the, the tormenting winds, the scorching winds of the fire. We used to beg Him meaning to save us from what he saved us from. Indeed, he is the most kind, he is the most merciful. So if you weren't back then, meaning now, apprehensive, and constantly begging Allah to save you, then you should be worried that you're not going to have that conversation in Jannah later. We were so worried until Allah saved us. You understand the, the point here? To present each ayah to your heart, to show you the flaws, the holes there, Number nine, compare similar scenes. And this is just like spectacular. One of the brothers that pointed this out, it was so nice, the researcher. Like Allah Azza He puts patterns there. And they're so clear. But not if you're the type of person that's letting one ayah get dismissed to admit the next ayah in. Not if your Quran is falling on deaf ears. For example, Musa alayhi salam says, Rabbi, bima an'amta alayya. My Lord, because you favored me, I'm never going to support the wrongdoers. Iblis, shaitan says, Rabbi bima aghwaytani, my Lord, because you've misled me. Look at the perspective of Musa alayhi salam, made him a prophet. Look at the perspective of shaitan, it made him the leader of disbelief. It's about perspectives, it determines whether you're saved or not. Me and our brother Ammar today, we were discussing the issue of perspective. The way you look at the world around you. You know, a person can sit there in prison and lose his mind because he cannot leave. And a person can realize, no, my, the guards are not the ones that are keeping me in here. This is the qadr of Allah keeping me in here. And he can be happier in there than his persecutors outside. Right or wrong? Depending on how Allah teaches and guides your heart to perceive things. The Quran is teaching us that. Your salvation is based on perspective and Allah is the grantor of perspective. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the pattern. Allah tells us that Ibrahim alayhi salam is willing to slaughter his son. And Banu Israel is not willing to slaughter a cow. Look at the, notice the pattern, the similar scenes that's supposed to teach you something. That it's not about the cow and it's not about your son. It's about who the commander of all that is. That's what's going to define you. The believer does not look at the details. He does not look at how big the sin is. He looks at who it is against whom he's sinning. Right? He doesn't look at how meaningless shaitan may tell you this act of worship is. How meaningful it is to see myself as a slave under, the, under Allah Azza wa Jal. Th those similar scenes would teach you that. Number 10 to notice the repetition of words. And don't let it fall on deaf ears. There's, there's so many examples of that. Of these examples, we just heard in Salat al-Maghrib. When Allah Azza wa Jal says, 
يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون O believers fear Allah and look at what you've sent for tomorrow for the hereafter and fear Allah Indeed Allah is fully acquainted with all that you do Why did he say fear Allah twice in the same ayah and keep in mind that Allah is speaking and being redundant, like repetitive without reason, redundancy is contrary to being eloquent. So why is the most eloquent speaker repeating here? Figure it out, right? As some of the ulama have said, there are a few opinions on this. O believers, fear Allah regarding what has passed and look at what you've already sent for tomorrow. And fear Allah regarding what's left because Allah knows what you did. Meaning, for, fix what's left, Allah will forgive what's past. You don't fear Allah and you mess up with what's left, He will call you to account for what has passed and what is left. Right? Possibly the meaning, or one of the meanings, figure it out. Don't be accepting of a superficial, right, surface level understanding. And the last of them, and perhaps the most important of them, to be truthful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Had they been truthful to Allah And that was the entire subject of today's khutbah It would have been so much better for them In dunya and in akhirah Be truthful in wanting to understand his message to you Be truthful in wanting to cure Or to purge the poisons out of your heart Through this Quran You know I mentioned to you two narrations about this That are very very beautiful Both of them And Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah he says He says we have heard in Allah's book that he said إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ فِي كِتَابٍ مَكْنُونٌ لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَهَّرُونَ It is in a noble Qur'an in a uh, preserved tablet preserved record that is not touched except by those that have been purified the majority of scholars say that this ayah forget the rulings that come from it but this ayah is originally speaking about the angels because they are the ones that touch the Qur'an up there the one in the Lawh Al-Mahfuz in the kitab that's maknoon, in the preserved record. Why are we being told that? Some ulama said, this is an indirect proof from Allah. As if to say, if those up there cannot touch that Qur'an except by virtue of them being the most pure, likewise you cannot touch the mushaf without being in a state of purity. That's the fiqhi discussion, right? The majority of the scholars, the four imams, are of the view that you need to be in wudu to touch the purely Arabic mushaf. Al-Bukhari rahimahullah says, and perhaps Allah is indirectly teaching us that you will not be able to touch, meaning fully come in contact with the reality of this Qur'an until you are of those that are pure. Spend time and continue to clean, detox, repent, read more and more Qur'an until you are permitted access to it. You understand the message? And the other one was mentioned by Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah regarding the hadith of Abu Talha al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu in Bukhari and Muslim. Abu Talha al-Ansari, he narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said لا تدخل الملائكة بيتا فيه صورة ولا كلب The angels don't enter a house wherein there is an image or a dog. He said, if the angels will not enter a house that contains an image, meaning of an animate object, or a dog, then how can knowing Allah, and loving Allah, and longing to meet Allah, and the sweetness of faith, enter a heart that contains the dogs of desires and clings to its images, the images of these false vanities of this, of this world. You got to clean it out, right? May Allah purify our hearts and grant us understanding and forgive the hypocrisy in our words and not make our share of this talk simply hearing and listening and nothing more. May Allah enable us to translate it into action and make what is remaining of our lives better than what has passed and the ultimate best day of our lives the day that we meet Him. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallahu khairan wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.